States. How do they convince people, especially the railroads? The railroads are coming through, they want people to move in so they have a market. How do they convince people to go plant in a desert, basically? To come take it, take a homestead and convince them they'll make it as a farmer. Science. Think about it for a second. Let me give you a scientific and logical argument. There are people here, right? It rains a lot here. Correct? No way, right? Not many people. Does it rain? People bring rain. Science. In fact, they had a name for it. The railroad said that human activity causes rain, and they called it rain follows the plow. So think about what humans do. They come into an area, they plow the field, there goes dust, dust into the sky. They light fires, burn firewood, dust and smoke into the sky. What does that create? Clouds. And what do clouds bring? Rain. So all you have to do is have mass amounts of human activity. So you come out there, sure it's not raining today, but tomorrow, rain. Flood. And that, here's the Milwaukee Railroad that died in 1974, but it went from Chicago through Montana to Seattle. And it's implying that you go to southeastern Montana, you'll plow up gold. And they convinced thousands of people to take homesteads, including all these people from Germany, German immigrants that came to North Dakota to go plow up gold in North Dakota. That's why there's all these German named cities in North Dakota, like Bismarck. And so they all came. As this, this might shock you, rain does not follow the plow. They all tried dry farming and it was a disaster. And especially what and the farm, the small farmers barely made it. Then the teens of the 20th century had an unusual amount of rain, just at a time when World War I hit. So demand for food went up dramatically. And then what happened in the 20s? It quit raining, demand dropped, and small farmers went into a depression that ended. Still hasn't. <laughs> Prices in 1918 are still higher then than if you take inflation into account than today. This killed small farmers. So they tried. And that American dream isn't going to be quite what they thought. They really thought that the individual could go west, plant his stake, and make it on their own. And it didn't quite work that way in the West, and it's not going to work in the industrial America. But the West is going to represent this. Assassin. Assassin. You're an assassin? I am. How may I help you? Who are you stealing? You just got here. I know. All right. That's what I'm seeing. So this would be the era of myths. Everybody write down the myth of the individual. The myth of the individual would be intertwined with the West. Can we do this? Fingers and then cross them both. Come on, let's see it. Let's see it. Like this. Cross them all four. You can't do it. Can you do them all? Not bad. See? This is an AP one. Now, do it with a shark. We'll get this stuff. And we got a quiz tomorrow. Chapter 17. Yeah. So I got I got to know All right, good. So here's Buffalo Bill's Wild West show. And I did not mention this yesterday with City Bowl, right? And here's a catalog. This is a sheet from an early Sears and Robot catalog where you get your own little six shooter. And that myth of the individual in the West became huge. Here's a Roy Rogers radio show, something like Quaker Oats, back in the 1940s. Roy Rogers would become one of the most famous Western stars. And the most famous Western star of the, of the 40s and early 50s, before John Wayne, which I know you heard of, was Randolph Scott, who appeared in a bunch of horrifically bad movies. Did you hear about that? Zero? Is that across the hall? Reptoids? Zero. Okay, so. No, it's a math. It's a math. 
Yeah. <laughs> Odds are I got that zero. What? <laughs> But this myth of the individual, and we'll come back to that myth, but it's going to be intertwined with the West. That's why I was doing this. See? How can you hide? Just cross this, and then. So, with that, because with industrialization, the myth of the West will change, but also. New heading. I can't get it to work. Oh no. Did I do oh you dummy? Me, I'm the dumb. Everybody watch just relax. Kick back. Write the second industrial revolution. <laughs> What's more relaxing than writing the second industrial revolution? Yeah, now we have the second one. We you guys caught the tail end of the third one. I lived through all three. Oh boy. I am as old as I like. Is we are we working now? Oh you scoundrel. Scoundrel. Paul would never do anything wrong. One more thing about the second industrial revolution. By the way, I thought that was great. We're all doing the finger thing until someone walked in. The second industrial revolution, the factors that led to this revolutionary change stem out of the first one. Now, the first industrial revolution, I called the steam revolution because I felt like it. I put down 1830 because that's when the first railroads hit. But, and that's, the, that would trigger a certain number of countries can enter it, begin in the marketplace, and the key industries, I gave this wonderful acronym, the key industries of the first industrial revolution. What's the T stand for? Textiles. What's the R? Railroads. I. What are you making it out of? Iron. What's the power source? Coal. So that's the first industrial revolution. Textiles, railroad, Iron and coal. And then in between the first and the second industrial revolution, the steam revolution and the electrical revolution, we have the Civil War. And the Civil War, think about massive government aid. The government's buying everything. And business is coming up with new and innovative ways to meet that challenge. It's going to create a whole new class of entrepreneurs, what gets we call robber barons. And these are Civil War wagons, many made by, made by machines for the Army of the Potomac. That's just some of them after Gettysburg. So this, works, I put that on their mass production. It's still kind of an old, archaic form. Well, the second Industrial Revolution would happen about 1870. And before we get to the key factors, two things. First off, I don't know how I did it, but I left it. I have like the white shadow of what I'm going to click to behind there. I don't even have, I have no idea how I did it. But I'm leaving it to the episodes. It's fine. But here's the acronym for the key industries of the second industrial revolution. Let's see if we can guess that. Rose C. Rose is what? This might be a little repetitive. Railroads. But what's O? Yes, bad bats. Meat bones and oil. Which actually relates to it. That's another story. S. Steel. Steel. Yeah. E. Engineering. Good guess, but electricity. electricity. And. Copper. Child <laughs> labor. Chemicals. The chemical industry we pick up. Where does the chemical industry come from, by the way? Most of it. To this day, petroleum. Most of the chemicals come from petroleum. So if you have a headache and take an Advil, thank you, Victoria. You take a little bit of gas, a little bit of gasoline. Hmm. What are all these cancer? Okay, that's not a story, but that's actually yeah. Wait, I can't see any. So first off, yeah, look, see, see the white shadow? It pops in. See what I mean? Isn't that weird? First off, labor. 
the number of workers in the workforce went up by immigration, people living longer, better food supplies, big things coming at the end through public health. Public health is the biggest, biggest thing that changed life expectancy there is in <laughs> public health. Yeah. So more workers in the workplace. Hmm? I'm confused about the order. Is this number three or yeah. is this number one? Oh, it should be number four. Oh, no, no, it's number three. It's number three. Okay. Number one, the first factor. So, so the first factor was the first. Yeah, okay. and I just put this up there just to remind me to do it. Okay. So that just, put that like an asterisk next to So TRIC was the first? Yeah, that's the first industrial revolution. This is the second. Is that better now? Sorry about that. Number four, banking. Banking. And the big thing is not quite modern banking we have today, but it's more stable banking system allowed for people to get credit to buy capital. What is capital again? Yeah, all the machines, all of that. And hello. Capital. And the thing about it is that what you gotta write down for banking and capital, this was credit. It allowed for the availability of credit. Business could not function without credit. Every business is in debt because they have to make investments to buy capital. They make the logical decision. I'll go into debt today because it's worth it to make a capital investment where I can make money to pay back the debt. Of course, it's hard to find anybody that's not in debt. All of you owe me big time. Next. Not sure where I'll go with that. Well, except for I do have a new Trump and very creepy Putin. Fingers, puppets. So we're good. Isn't this C? Trump and Putin. Well, <laughs> yeah, yeah, without a shirt. Why did you get a Is that how we get news? Next. It is. Same thing with the labor supply, but population was going up dramatically. And with the population going dramatically, that increases the market. There's more people to buy goods and a more diversified market. It encourages innovation, partially because of immigration. Because of all the immigrants coming in, it greatly expanded the market, more people to buy goods, making a growing economy, more jobs and higher wages. Immigration in a very narrow market for a short run might drop wages because you increase the supply of workers. But in the long run, immigration greatly expands the market, therefore increasing the size of the economy, increasing the wealth for everybody. And third and fourth grade, all I could think about was the contribution immigration made to food and the market selling food because I was really hungry. I'm actually not as hungry anymore. So, but I still think about food because I can make I'm not hungry again. <laughs> yeah. Okay, with that. The Southern opposition to many of these programs were gone. And the big thing about that was, remember Clay's American system way back when? Internal improvements, bank, and tariff? Clay's, Southerners always opposed that. But after the Civil War, that opposition is gone. And even when, when Redeemer governments came back, it was part of the deal. They wouldn't oppose things like tariffs as much, and Northern politicians, wouldn't look at what's going on in the South. They'd let Jim Crow laws go. It was a deal they kind of made. It wasn't that Southerners wanted the tariffs, because they didn't at that time, but they also wanted to be left alone in their estates. So that Southern opposition would be gone. And then a very important one, and this is number seven, I don't care what anybody says, technological innovations. And I told you about this in the first Industrial Revolution, but this is why I put that great quote by Isaac Newton, who wrote Principia Mathematica. Remember, Newton invented calculus for all you math lovers. And what else? But his theory of what? It would be motion, too, but also gravity. Gravity is probably the most famous, but yeah. And the big thing about gravity was, I, I just about said he invented gravity. <laughs> so when everyone just flying around, and I was like, thank you. But he said that because he looked at previous mathematicians and other work, and he would be, what is it, just philosophers then, and he built on their experiments, just like technological innovation builds on other experiments to this very day. And he could never have done that without Jonas Kaplan. 
and Kepler, who came up with the uh, about the elliptical orbits and planetary motion. I was Kepler, and then Newton came up with the mathematical formula about why that works. But it's Kepler who did that. And Kepler also invented calculus, and Newton perfected it. Kepler's calculus. If you don't like calculus now, you would have loved calculus. Nothing but adding up billions of little triangles. But moving on, <laughs> which shows how brilliant the guy was. One of the best examples of this was the Bessemer and open hearth pro process. But this is the invention of making steel. Before, very skilled craftsmen made steel. It was called puddling or puddlers. And they could only make small amounts because to get that heat and control it, to control the heat because you had to superheat iron and a few other things like zinc and cadmium and nickel, burn out the imperfections and you come up with steel, much stronger, much more durable than iron. The Bessemer process used a massive cauldron that they could control the heat better, they could make the iron better to make the cauldron, and make significantly higher quality steel. It was invented in Britain, but the United States, U.S. companies like Andrew Carnegie would be the first ones to really invest in it. He saw the future. This is Open Hearth, where it's essentially the Bessemer project, the Bessemer process significantly increased to produce large amounts of high quality steel. And once you have that steel, it's so much superior to iron. It's stronger and lighter. So, well, it's no coincidence. Once you have steel, the building's not tall. And of course, walking upstairs became an issue. Think about innovation begotting other innovations. Yeah, telephone and jetpacks. To get up to the top, no, obviously the elevators, right? They can get taller and lighter. And it still gets lighter. You don't need as much framing, so even more room inside. If you ever had the, um, ever been to the Empire State Building in New York, you know, it's huge, but there's a lot of steel frame everywhere, so the rooms have to be relatively small. Then go to a more modern building. World Trade Center. The rooms can be huge, but steel is so much stronger. It can hold less steel, it can hold up a taller building. So that's where you get the, the mass production of steel, where there's a lot of coal and iron. What city is this, by the way? That's Pittsburgh. And that's why it's the steel city. In fact, the Pittsburgh Steelers, their, their logo was they had the they paid a copyright to the company called US Steel. That's US Steel's book. You don't think about it in the NFL. That's where they got it. Yes, in 1900, then because of all the coal they used to, to heat it up to 1500 degrees, you could literally chop through the air of Pittsburgh. It was so blue. It was that bad. And so, and it would be that way until about the 1960s. When I was a kid, it was still like that. So, with that, Another one, and it's something we just take for granted. So refrigerated railway cars, okay, refrigerated cold food, whatever, right? Gustavus Swift and Jacob Armour came over there. They're Swift. They didn't actually invent it. They own packing plants. And so you can try to guess you know, the connection between refrigerated cars and the packaging of meat. And think, okay, well, they're refrigerated cars. And this is something that they've been inventing. This goes back to the turn of the century. They try to use steam powered um, air conditioning and refrigeration, which the whole process is not somehow steam powered refrigeration doesn't make sense. But all you're doing is sucking out the old air, transferring it with cooler air. But this changed everything. Much like still, this changed the entire world. How people ate, where they got their food, their connection to their food, all of that changed. Overnight, in the U.S. and every other country, once they adopted this modern system to transport food. Before refrigerated cars, the main source of protein was meat. A cow, let's say. A cow is slaughtered. How long did you have until you had to eat it? Yeah. Yeah, just less than a week. How do you eat pretty fast? Cows, cow rots, actually beef rots really fast pork a little bit longer, but still. So what that meant is, every town, every neighborhood, what did they have to have in that neighborhood? Like a slaughterhouse and a butcher, right there, didn't they? It was right there, right in your neighborhood. That means when you walked around your neighborhood or walked to school, you could walk through blood. 
walk through the offal, which is all the insides, the intestines, and everything else. It's right there. In fact, it was a pretty common thing, you know, to go get a bucket of the blood or something. The stew, I know. I mean, it sounds good to me, too. But diets have changed a little bit. Oh, they're right there connected with them. Not only that, but all the other things. You've got that local market right there in the neighborhood. Now, once you can have refrigerated cars, all those little feedlots, all those little slaughterhouses, they're not needed anymore. And they can focus on the massive feedlot in, let's say, Chicago, where you send all the cows to one location and then do all the slaughtering and all the packing right there at Armour's plant. And come up with canned foods and then packaged meats. And ship it out and it's safe because, relatively safe, because of refrigeration. Everything changed. And so get that down. That allowed for, that allowed for the mass processing of food. And everyone's diet changed overnight. What do you call it? This mass processing of food. When we're talking mass, what advantage this gave them? What do you call it? When a company, a business, an entity gets bigger, they become more efficient. Their cost per unit drops and they have a competitive advantage. What is that called? This is economies of scale. How can any small slaughterhouse compete with this? And so what happened to all those little, not all of them, but most of them, the little packing plants, the little slaughterhouses. I know it's a horrible saying, but that's what happens there. The little butcher shops, what happened to almost all of them? One by one, they went out of business. And pretty soon, all the little local stores and markets went out of business, too, because they're not needed anymore because of refrigeration. And food can be done at central location and then sent to one of the places. Except by the time you get cars, what are you going to have? Supermarkets. And then the big, the massive box stall stores. How we eat totally changed, didn't it? Overnight. Now, in some ways, the diet got better. By mass production becoming more efficient, people had, had access to protein they never had access to. And I know there could be a lot of different ways of protein, but just having more protein, what happened to people? Healthier, stronger, bigger, heights got taller and taller. Why? Mass production of meat. Now, there's more, there's more sources of protein now if you don't want to eat meat, but back then, that was basically it. If you want protein. What a huge shift. I mean, our entire life changed. And now you are two, three, four steps away from the actual production of your food. You don't even see it. It's neat. It seems clean. Right? You are connected from it. It's this abstract thing. This activity that is you don't want to think about just happens and you get a burn. So there's a big separation. That is a big change in society. Did you think it was going to go this far with refrigerated cars? This is a big deal. One of those things we just don't even think about. Also, wow. And by the way, you're putting a lot of faith in someone else's prepared food. And you don't know what goes what goes on behind those doors, do you? Spam. Okay, with that. Oh, what we'll a day we'll talk about it. Look at the ingredients of Doritos. You know exactly what I'm talking about. Who likes Doritos? Don't look at the ingredients. But if you like Fritos, you're good. Fritos, three ingredients. That's it. Three. No, I have Kit Kat. Wafer, chocolate, and love. What? <laughs> what, is, what do Fritos have? Corn, oil, and salt. That's all your food. You add wafer to that and chocolate, and you don't need anything else. <laughs> what did Alexander Graham Bell have had? It could be anything on the bottom of the sheet. Oh. And he yeah. he actually took the took the uh, shoes are in the amp. They're so comfortable. He took the uh, eight other inventions to come up with. He, it was going to be an aid for the deaf. Or people who had hard of hearing, but he came up with the telephone and Alexander. It would be Thomas Edison's invention of 
of a, something that will amplify sound that would allow phones to be used. They run sound waves through charcoal and that amplifies them. Yeah. Edison ran, again, these people run it through all kinds of different things and charcoal turned out to be the best. They still use it today. If you get one of the really fancy, really good speakers and open it up and rip it behind, there's a little pouch of charcoal. charcoal. Don't eat it. So that's Alexander Graham. But we'll talk more about what this would change, but we'll do that within the 1920s. We're going to get really a wider country. So another innovation, Scholl's invented foot inserts. That's what someone said. Third, I enjoyed it immensely. The typewriter. See how this would revolutionize news, printing, be quicker, more efficient. More material could get out. Now, it's all done by hand. He had also invented the keyboard that we still use today. Why do you invent the keyboard? Keyboard's the way it is. Why are letters we use the most we want to use our pinky with? Have you thought about that? Where's the period? What letter, what, what figure do you use to do the period? Don't you use periods a lot? Did you ever wonder why the keyboard is the way it is? The first way they did it, they literally had, each time you press down on the key, a little hammer would come up with a lettering trick on it. And it would go through a little, basically a piece of cloth with ink on it, and press it down on paper and leave the impression. But the problem is, if you go too fast, the hammer's jammed. So you press slower. So it's a slow you down so it doesn't jam. Now, that doesn't matter, but that's how everybody learned how to type from when they first had typewriters. So we just keep it going. So we have this system that doesn't make sense. But that's how come we have that. So it doesn't jam. The electric dynamo is kind of a big deal. Michael Faraday, another Brit, he invented a method to make electricity. And what he did is by experimentation, they had like these little static electricity machines. He was experimenting with magnets, actually. And he discovered by running electricity down a steel cable and then dumping iron filings through it, iron, you know, little, little pieces of iron, the steel with electricity acted as a magnet. If electricity creates a magnet, he had a eureka moment. Will a magnet create electricity? And the answer was yes. This is his dynamo that he made. I don't know what he's doing there. That's a battery. But this is a schematic of it today. But what it is, basically, you have a hand crank. This is his first one. You turned a, a magnet. Around the magnet was iron surrounded by copper. You turn that, and you get an electric charge. And that's how they make electricity to this day. It's a dynamo. So if you go out to Canyon Ferry and say, how does water create electricity? It goes through the electric tree and then they, no. They shoot the water through a, wind, a water mill. It turns a magnet, electricity. Windmill, electricity. Coal creates steam. They run the steam through another, basically a wheel, turns the wheel, turns the magnet, electricity. That's one problem they have with solar power. They have to create electricity in a different way, and that's what I mean. They've done amazing things, but still problematic. No, let me get to one thing really quick. The problem was how they get there. And everybody write down alternating versus direct current. How do you do this? Do you know what alternating current is? Do you know what direct current is? Direct current is one line, battery, electric source, light bulb, let's say. The problem with that is it can't go over a very long distance, but that's what Edison wanted, direct current. He wanted every home to have a little electric dynamo. <laughs> to prove alternating current was so bad, they murdered Topsy, who was condemned to die. Topsy the elephant was condemned to die because he killed his hand. I'm not kidding, they're going to kill the elephant. Edison executed him with electricity. I know they killed an elephant. And by the way, think about this for a second. They actually had a trial and they condemned the elephant to death. Like that would deter other elephants from from crime. As we all know.
See you tomorrow, right when you find work. Let's make steel, everybody. Let's yeah. make steel. steel. What kind? I can make steel. I lift it up.